My name is Allison Lindbergh and I serve as a board member of the Minnesota chapter of the U.S. Green Building Council. Matt is the founding principal of the Thrive Collaborative. He is also an amazing speaker. First of all, I would like to thank our generous sponsors for supporting this keynote and all of you for being here. Join me in welcoming Matt as we conclude our Impact 2014 conference with his talk. Designing for the post-carbon economy, it's zero or nothing. What I really want to make the case for today is that we need to design everything from our systems to how we run schools, to our buildings, to our refrigerators, to our cars, everything. We need to design more like an old growth forest and less like a tree farm because monocrops fail. Everything that constantly needs external inputs over time fails, despite that short-term output. You can legibly figure out how much tree farm is producing until it's not. It goes from great production to zero very, very quickly. But biodiversity, biodiversity thrives. Biodiversity and complexity actually breeds resilience. And that's the way nature designs things. So complex systems, though, are not complicated systems. Our sewage treatment plants, our energy systems, those are complicated systems. They're not complex systems. They're actually overly simplified. And what happens with radically simple solutions, they always fail in nature, always. And when we become disconnected from these laws of physics, like 10-year-old little boys, like this kid is thinking he's going to have a great time. Water plus a 200-foot drop equals fun. But he doesn't understand the consequences of his actions. And I'll tell you, a lot of architects, the same thing, and designers and builders and people who create refrigerators and run schools and cities, we're also disconnected from these laws of physics. And we start designing buildings like this that people have dubbed the fry scrapers. And I say scrapers because he's actually designed multiple buildings that have done this. This is one in Las Vegas that was designed basically as a massive parabolic mirror that was frying Vegas tourists out by the pool. All right, now when you fry a couple of Vegas tourists out by the pool, not very many people pay attention. But you start frying people's jaguars on the streets of London, I'm not kidding, I can't make this stuff up. This is an actual Jaguar burned by an actual building on the streets of London. Melted the dashboard, melted the side panels, anything that was plastic in this car melted from a building that was completely disconnected from the consequences of its design. So what we need to do is figure out how do we localize these consequences? I, because when we localize the consequences, we are quickly persuaded to take smarter action. Right? They've actually done studies about this, that when we can connect more closely with the people that we're collaborating with, we actually become more compassionate people. When we're, we honk at somebody on the road, but we would never push somebody in line, the more localized we are to those consequences, the better the results, the more compassionate we are, the better designers we are. Right now what we're doing is we're building these buildings that are reduced to little boxes. And they're little boxes that are just not networked. Everything is built on this grid pattern. So what I contend is that whenever we design anything, whether it's a system or a product or our own homes, we have to ask a simple question. Is what we're building life degrading? Does it degrade the quality of life for the people right there and then all of the things in the network that is connected to? This is actually an overpass that came down in Seoul, Korea. Or is it life enhancing? Does it improve the life? Does it take less from its surrounding environment, from the people around it, than it is giving back? That's the way nature works. Nature is by its design life enhancing and resilient. So what I suggest, and hopefully by the time we're done, I think we will prove that what we need to do is ungrid our energy system and ungrid our water systems. Because what we do is when we break things down in this com complex system into smarter, smaller component parts, and we distribute the energy and we distribute the water systems, 
we get a much more resilient and better result. So let me tell you a story about our house. This is our house in Ann Arbor, Michigan in 2006. My wife and I ran by this house and we looked at that with the asbestos siding and the, and the paneled front porch and said, that is our dream house. We want to live there. And then we went inside and we discovered it had zero insulation in the attic except for a layer of newspaper dated 1901. We had lead paint on the walls. I mean, seriously, this is every tree hugger's dream, right? We've got windows that are the original windows that have been painted shut for decades, had not been opened, and yet still leaked a huge amount of energy. We had carpeting covering 500-year-old heart pine floors that were from trees that were probably growing when Columbus sailed for America. We had a refrigerator in the kitchen. That's where you keep refrigerators. Uh, that was from 1989, and you could hear this thing humming all over the house. We had toilets that were flushing five gallons a minute. We had sinks that were flowing at three gallons a minute. We had pink formica, genuine faux marble on the walls. With uh, One of my favorite things was that the previous owner of the house knitted uh, shower curtains out of, uh, out of old terry cloth pink bath towels. Uh, it had no shower in the house, by the way. Uh, this was the Mueller Climatrol furnace down in the basement from 1957 it was installed. We still had the original installation stickers on there. That thing was never going to die and probably operated around 40% efficiency. And for the privilege, we got to pay $350 a month in the wintertime and heat up buckwheat pillows in the microwave, shove them down at the bottom of our beds where we had socks on and completely covered with two down comforters and sweatpants and sweatshirts. And then we took this house, we removed the asbestos siding, we removed some of the lead paint, we restored the windows, we did all these things to the house. And we did this all within the standards of the National Trust for Historic Preservation and the Department of Interior. And we won a Historic Preservation Award, restoring the house rather than doing a gut rehab to it. And we actually had one of the relatives of the original owners of the home who actually lived there uh, in the 1950s while their family was building another house and he said that this is exactly how the house looked when, they, when, they, uh, when he was growing up. This is how the house looks today. We've made this house net zero energy. It is now 113 years old. And because of this, we started to get a lot of attention, and I've learned a lot of things, so we started a consulting company called Thrive, working with companies, working with, with, uh, with people who are developing homes, with office buildings, and, uh, and now Polymath, which its goal is to harvest materials from the city of Detroit to rehab materials in the city of Detroit, or buildings in the city of Detroit, and build new buildings that are all either net zero energy or living buildings. That is all we will do and work on. Either net zero energy or living buildings, because frankly, that is all we must be doing. And because of this, we've gotten a lot of attention. Like it's, my wife is just starting to realize that people around the country are listening to her home, which for her is just a home. But USA Today, The Atlantic, Fox Business News, magazines all over the place. My Ford Magazine called me the, the number one electric innovator. Uh, I was called the proven zero energy master, uh, which is one of my favorites. Uh, we've been on the cover of books. We're in a full chapter in the new book, People Habitat, chapter three is all about the work that I've been doing and on the house, uh, in magazines everywhere. I was even you know, part of Fox News energy team. And, and even though I talked about how it's not about the insulation, it's not about solar panels, what this is really about is love. Because the space that we create our homes is just an opportunity to create the comfort so that we may experience joy and happiness. And they still invited me back anyway several times. And I, I've gotten to do uh, talks at Google as part of their video series. You can watch one of those online, learn a little bit more about the house and the AIA and all these other things all around the world. Uh, My Ford Magazine put our family as a centerfold. By the way, that was during a drought. They photoshopped the green onto the brown grass. Uh, and then I went and said, hey, this is a really cool prototype of your new electric vehicle. Uh, let me take a test ride. And they said, no. I said, well, screw you. And we went out and bought a Chevy Volt. Uh, so that's a Chevy Volt filling up with a tank full of sunshine. And then I was invited to give a TED talk called How to Destroy the Planet from the Comfort of Your Own Home. USA Today honored the house as one of the best greenhouses in America. 
uh, we were told that we had a lifestyle that was greener than grass. And this one I'm particularly proud of. How, how many people here are aware of the environment? Because you all deserve this award. This is a very low bar. This is from the Realtors Association. But they're giving awards for this stuff now. So uh, the Atlantic really flattered us with the phrase sustainable perfection, that our home was sustainable perfection. But I, I have something to share with you. It's all bullshit. There is no such thing as a sustainable building. There's actually no such thing as a sustainable anything, one thing, because all of life is sustained by underlying networks. That's how nature works. When we violate that, when we fail to produce complex systems, when we oversimplify things and make them complicated, but not complex, they fail. They need to recognize the components that make up complex networks. Benoit Mandelbrot, who was the father of fractal geometry, said that think not of what you see, but what it took to produce what you see. So when you see a field of snow in Minnesota, wait, I know that we shouldn't be talking about that right now. Forget, think of another example of sand on a beach. Uh, I'm from Ann Arbor, so we had the worst winter ever too. Think about what it took to create that field of snow. And if we were to design that, what we do, we would just take paint and paint the field. No, it's actually little tiny crystals that are repeated endlessly, one after the other, to create each unique snowflake, but with the same simple rule, the same starting point, until it snows and we get this whole field, this wonderful complex system that's connected to the winds and the sun and, 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 and rain. And it turns out everything in nature has the same fractal geometry. When we get down to the smallest component, it's just these little things repeated over and over and over again that are simple that create these complex networks. And this fractal geometry, we can see it in trees, we can see it in river systems, in watersheds, we can see it in our cloud patterns, in our storms, we can see it in cells, we can see it all the way out to the galaxy. So we really need to design for this kind of complexity. That's the big what, and as Sir Mix-a-Lot once said, I like big what's and I cannot lie. And it turns out that these kind of patterns are actually hardwired into us. They call it biophilia, this in innate love of nature. And what they found, this is actually a Jackson Pollock picture with a bunch of mathematicians actually discovered that there is this zone of fractal dimensions that actually reduces stress. You go below or above this little zone of these fractal dimensions and your stress levels actually go up and they calm you down. Well, it turns out, and there's no way that Jackson Pollock could have known what he was doing. This looks like complete chaos. It's not, there's a pattern there. There's a pattern that actually calms us down that other splatter paintings do not mimic. And people who do not know Jackson Pollock when they're put in these simulators with fMRIs are actually experiencing calm when looking at a Jackson Pollock painting, but not a random splatter painting because it's not random. There is a pattern there. And that pattern actually mimics the same pattern that we're finding in nature. And we're finding this pattern repeated endlessly at various levels of magn magnification. So if we zoom in, so each one of these, the Jackson Pollock painting and the tree has a certain fractal dimension. And if we just take a little po por portion of that and we zoom into it, it has the same fractal dimension. No matter how much you go in, no matter how much you pull out, the fractal dimension remains the same. It's absolutely extraordinary to think about. So instead of asking what's the next big thing in designing net zero buildings, what we really need to be talking about is what's the next small thing? So the two big things, net zero energy, net zero water, that are absolutely vital. Net zero energy I'm gonna start with because net zero energy is not a challenge, it's a choice. All the technology we need, everything we need is there. It's also, and this is the most important thing you should take away, it's not optional. We have to do this. I was actually just out at uh, uh, Hetch Hetchy in, uh, uh, up by Yosemite Park. We drove for over an hour through burned out forests. 
completely burned out forests. They were literally in the cabin we were staying, 15 feet from the cabin were burned redwood trees. Drove for an hour through this. Just past that, that wasn't burned, were the power lines that go from Hetch Hetchy to the city of San Francisco. This is what is making officials in San Francisco, not earthquakes, this is what's making them crap their pants. If those power lines burn in one of these fires, it took two months for that fire to burn. They couldn't even get in there to repair the power lines. They would have lost power in the entire city of San Francisco for two months before they could start work repairing that system. This is a dangerous system we're playing with, these, this grid system. We need to distribute this energy. And then, when we pull out beyond that system and we look at what it takes on the planet, James Hansen and his crew, you've heard about this study for years now, basically said that in order to stabilize atmospheric CO2, keep that number below 450 parts per million, the climate requires that net CO2 emissions be reduced to near zero. I don't see this as a suggestion from these physicists and scientists. He's saying this is required. We have to stop putting carbon into the atmosphere. Stop. Not reduce it a little bit. Not hit a reduction target. The reduction targets would just, just be towards getting us to zero. We have to stop. So, this is a really fascinating photograph because this is actually in our neighborhood. That's now, uh, today, the Grizzly Peak Brewing Company in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where we go up to the brew pub and have beers. What's really neat is when this photograph was taken, that was the Philip Gauss Saloon. We bought our house from Gert Gauss. Philip Gauss was Gert's dad. He ran this saloon. This was the day that they were wiring our neighborhood for the first time ever with electric utilities. Every time one of these lines got put up, this became that first moment in that area that human beings in human history could burn things remotely. If we wanted energy, if we wanted the benefit, we had to be there. We had to light the match ourselves or be very close to the person who lit it. This was the first time we could just flip a switch and remotely do it. And this was the beginning of that disconnect of our power and where we were getting it from. So now coal could be burned you know, a day's horse drive away and we could still get power into our little Victorian house. So we have to reconnect with our energy supply. Maybe not like this kid's doing it, but um, the, the same way that nature does, right? It's connected to its energy supply. It can't move and get energy somewhere else or water somewhere else. So let me show you what's possible. This, this is our uh, uh, 2012 through 2013, and, and I'll be fair, this was actually just one of the best years we had. Um, 9,600 kilowatts hours of solar. We used 8,100 of that for a net positive of 1,400 kilowatt hours for the year in a 113-year-old home. This was our energy bill from this morning. I just pulled this up. It's negative $96 for the month. All right. This was the day after spring. My daughter, Dahlia, was born seven weeks ago on the first day of spring. Um, and we came home, and the first thing that was there was a check in the mailbox from the utility company. And it wasn't the money that I was excited about. It was the thought that, that this little girl is perhaps one of the first humans on Earth who is part of this transformation to being, growing up never knowing what it's like to be in a carbon consuming building. Never knowing what it's like to drive a combustion car. And I thought that was pretty damn exciting. So this is what it's gonna do for our family over the 30 year cycle. It's gonna transform from being, a, a, a paying the utility company to receiving a shift in benefit, including our renewable energy credits of $283,000. This is extraordinary, but now, this is the fascinating thing about this to all the architects and builders in the, in the room. We have R13 in our walls. We put in some cellulose insulation. We put in whatever we could. It wasn't a gut rehab. R13, for those of you who don't know, that doesn't even meet code for a new home. It's a little bit of insulation. We tightened it up as much as we could. We put spray foam in the attic for a total of R29. Code in Michigan now for new homes over 40. We restored the old windows. We didn't put in new windows. First, because the Historic Preservation Office said we couldn't um, if we wanted the tax credit, uh, and the local historic district said we couldn't uh, if we wanted to live there. Um, 
but we were able to restore these windows and prove that we were able to seal them and restore them to a, almost as good of an airflow reduction as in brand new windows. At a huge cost savings to us, and we got the benefit of restoring this thing, and we put on some locally made storm windows on the outside, which tightened it up a little bit more. So we got this HERS score of 37. Everybody familiar with the HERS score? Anyone not familiar with the HERS score? Well, the HERS score is, is uh, 100 is a code-built home. 80 is 20% better than code, and that'll get you energy star. And zero is net zero energy. So after we became net zero energy, they did this rating, and they looked at it, and they said, oh, you're a HERS score of 37. And I was like, wait a minute, but, you know, but the data shows that we're zero. So the HERS scores is really missing something here, and it turns out when they did this analysis of the HERS ratings, they have a 43% margin of error. Is this really the target we should be using? You know, so things like CBEX and all these other things where we target old buildings, existing buildings, are irrelevant when your target is zero. So I ask you the question, what is the secret to net zero energy then? It's clearly not the building, although our building, our home actually was built recognizing the patterns of nature, so it does have some inherent passive building, uh, passive design to it. Most of the windows are on the south side. Uh, it's got an east-west axis, it's got airflow, it's got a basement that can cool and the air can go up through the attic and self-cool in the summertime. So it has these elements built in, but it wasn't a code-built home to today's standards. So I, I asked this question right here. Y'all are the first people I've asked this to. Which one uses more energy? An old Victorian home or the world's most efficient LED light bulb, a single one light bulb versus the entire home. Which one uses more energy? Anyone? The, she says the home? It's the light bulb uses more energy. Buildings don't use energy. This building doesn't use energy. It's all the stuff we put into the building that uses energy. And this is where the successes have been in net zero buildings, is that they're beginning to focus on how we use buildings. So we're, we're not just looking at the building design, which is vital, but you have to strike this balance between the building design and the behavioral design. What you're putting into the building and understanding the true way that humans behave and design around the humans that we are, rather than the humans we wish they would be, turning off lights and being ultra efficient. So I ask that we have to stop blaming the occupant here. Uh, th and that's what we tend to do, is it's their fault after we built, we built the perfect building, we spent all this money, I don't understand why it's not net zero energy. But maybe we should blame it on the old ladies in Pasadena who are smoking medical marijuana because of their swollen joints. Uh, what, what Berkeley discovered was that uh, one kilo of, green, of, of indoor grown medical marijuana actually uses the same carbon as driving a Prius for an entire year. And they calculated that now 3% of California's electricity comes from indoor grown pot, right? So may maybe we need to start advocating for lead gold grow houses now. But, and, and I'll be honest, this actually has nothing to do with my talk whatsoever, but when I learned this, it was too fascinating to pass up. So, we really need to decentralize our thinking and start looking at what is actually using electricity and energy. These are all actual things in our house, in our house. and uh, I got Canadian on you there. Uh, the, uh, the, yeah, and I want you to just pay attention to that little clock down there, because we're going to come back to that little clock. Uh, people assumed that we were just hippies bathing in our pasta water, and as it turns out, we actually have as many appliances as the average American home does. So we have to really think about what I call just-in-time energy. And if you're familiar with manufacturing and delivery processes, it's, uh, it's very much the same thing. No waste involved, right? And not, don't confuse this with Justin Timberlake or Justin Bieber. It's just-in-time energy. This is uh, my friend at the University of Michigan, Alex Watanabe, created this just as a model that he was working on to visualize the absolute extreme of what we could do with existing technology today putting on Google goggles, wiring the light systems with, that would only be providing light that is within the peripheral vision of all of the occupants in the room. I know this is crazy stuff, but theoretically, it's pushing the idea to the limit. How are we using energy and getting 100% of the benefit of the energy for, that, that we're consuming? Uh, if, if it's lighting back here and we can't see it, that's energy we're paying for or using that we're not getting a benefit from. So we need to think of everything we do like this drawing, like how can we get as close to this ideal as possible? 
So some of the things that are off the shelf right now, these smart thermostats that control 50% of a home's energy, and Nest just came out with a thing this morning that um, they're able to reduce, if I'm not mistaken, it was uh, during peak loads, they're able to reduce cooling loads uh, by 55% during peak hours, which is extraordinary considering that most of it is during peak hours. Uh, light sensors and all this, I call this a Snooky syndrome, because if, if the, the lights are on in nobody's home, but if, if we leave a room and the light knows you're not in the room, it should be able to turn off for you. Very, very simple, affordable control systems that actually is required by code in California now. So we look at things and say, okay, which things use more energy? We had this, this was a clock radio that I bought just after law school. And I know how much everything uses in my house, and I know that clock radio, 24-7, 365 days a year, uh, was 10 watts of energy. Well, you multiply that by 8,760 hours in a year, and you have 87.6 kilowatt hours in a year. Well, it turns out our television set uses only 53 kilowatt hours a year, and we get to watch TV. So it's these tiny little things, the coffee pot in the office, the fax machine, the, 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 all of these different office devices that are constantly on providing zero service. Now you can argue, well, the clock radio is telling time. It's not telling time, it's keeping time till you arrive in the room to get for it to tell you the time. So we need to figure out how to make clock radios and everything else that we design provide that service at the moment we need it, not a second sooner, not a second later, and use only the energy while you're getting that service. Our Christmas lights, Turns out, our Christmas lights, which are on a timer, I did everything right, they're LEDs, they only use 20 watts when they're on. When I actually looked at our energy data, I was like, holy crap, our lawnmower and all of the other devices that we use outside the house, in the yard during the summer, listen to the radio, trim trees, build things, all of the other devices use less energy over the course of a year than our Christmas lights do. Now, if Minnesota's anything like Ann Arbor, you keep your Christmas lights on from November to March, but you get the point. Fault detection systems, especially in commercial buildings, are huge. This is our, I hate charts, but this is so important because it's incredibly graphic, not just because of the language. Uh, but that is our energy consumption uh, a couple of years ago in the month of January, in a typical January, I think it was actually warmer than usual, where we had a fault in our geothermal system that we didn't catch for three weeks. By the time we caught it, we used uh, almost a quarter of our energy for that year came from this fault. The same model, the updated version of this, has a fault detector that would have told us this the moment it happened and would have alerted our HVAC contractor. So fault detection systems are vital and they're so affordable, it's crazy. If you're buying a product, ask them to spec, do you have a fault detection system in this? What are your fault detection systems? The more you ask, the more they're gonna do it and uh, virtually every big HVAC system and things have these built into them now. The old school appliances, right? Now that looks like a new washer and dryer, but that's the first generation of, of uh, a high efficiency washer. We just replaced ours, it was only eight years old, and because it was old technology and was spinning so fast, it vibrated the hell out of everything and broke. The new ones actually have sensors to stabilize it and a fan that runs at 10 watts that pre-dries your laundry so that when you wake up in the morning and the, you put it in the dryer, the dryer loads in our house are now taking half the time, which incidentally only saves about 30% of the energy because it's mostly front loaded, but still 30% energy reduction in the dryer, the same dryer, new washing with one tiny piece of technology, a small, simple thing added to the network. Our stove, uh, our, our uh, existing refrigerator, all of these things now are being transformed. We now have an induction cooktop. That old picture was the original one that came with the house. We have an induction cooktop that's saving about 50%. It's actually more than that, I think, for the whole year, uh, off of what the therms converted to kilowatts would have been for the uh, existing stove. In, in every manufacturer, including Whirlpool and Electrolux and everybody else, all the American manufacturers in Europe are now selling heat pump clothes dryers that use 60% less energy than the clothes dryers we're using here. There are people who are working on phase change refrigerators that will operate their compressors only during off-peak hours at night, and that's gonna be enough to keep the refrigerator cool for the entire day with another 60% reduction. Everything is getting better and better. We just upgraded uh, Rheem, it was a, a, a smart tank that we were actually able to turn off while we went on vacation and is using 50% less energy than the original tanks that we had in there. 
So now California code is starting to require net zero energy because they know this is possible. We just need to do this. If we're going to get to these carbon targets by, of zero by 2030, we need to start doing this now. All new homes are required by code to be net zero energy starting in 2020. Net zero ready by 2016, two years from now. So now I want you to think about the implications of this. That Bakersfield, California, a new home built in 2020 will be net zero energy. We could cross the border over into Nevada and we could build a lead platinum building with all possible points that's not net zero energy. And it wouldn't meet code in Berkeley, I mean, in Bakersfield. I mean, think about this. How can we bestow our highest award on a house across the border that doesn't even meet code in Bakersfield? Think about this. Now, this is leadership in energy and environmental design, right? I mean, how can we call ourselves leaders? We, maybe we need to change the name to EAD if we don't catch up to, the, to, to municipal codes starting in 2020. So for net zero energy, it's easy. Reduce our energy consumption, we go nuclear, but we put the nuclear power plant 93 million miles away and we power it wirelessly, and then we go nuts. This is the Living Building Challenge team from Blue Lab, the School of Engineering at the University of Michigan. These students are amazing. There's now 40 students on this team. We've given our house as a community test bed for them. Said, so you come in whenever you want, uh, do modeling, do all kinds of things, and you take this net zero energy home that was built in 1901, and you make it net zero water and create a model for transforming the entire water system throughout the US. And they're doing it. So this is the real challenge is net zero water. How do we take this existing infrastructure and change it to net zero water? We can go three days without water. This is pretty darn important. So like energy, net zero water is not optional. This is something that we have to achieve. Uh, Peter Gleck actually just recently coined the term peak water, and he makes a very, very good case. And I was actually just meeting with somebody this morning here talking about how the state of Minnesota is a net water exporter. We are losing more water each year than is being replenished. And we're in the Great Lakes here. That's a very, very dangerous system. So arguably, we have hit peak water even in Minnesota. The cool thing is, is that when our house was built, it was already net zero water. And so the students are actually trying to restore the ecological water flow of this site while we temporarily use some of the water. But at the time, this was uh, uh, Gert, the woman we bought the house from, Gert Gauss's older brother, Robert Gauss, uh, in 1913. There's the composting toilet back there. Um, uh, we had a well that brought up all the fresh water that needed to be, the, the cistern was capturing rainwater to water the gardens and give water to the chickens and the dog in the back that you see there. We still have that lilac tree, by the way. Uh, and we look and we think, well, you know, but, but who cares? You know, we've water, we're in the Midwest, we've got, we're in the Great Lakes. I mean, take a look at where our house is. It's right there on the mitten. Do you guys, you don't have a mitten here to give directions. Our house is right there, surrounded by 22% of the world's fresh water supply. We don't need to worry about water, but this is a zoom into Ann Arbor. And what all these beautiful colors are, there's our house there with the red arrow. We sit on top of what they call the Paul Gelman plume. Like many other cities around the world, uh, in the 1970s, dilution was a solution to pollution, so they were spraying 1,4-dioxane out onto the fields, which has now contaminated the groundwater in that entire green patch that you see, and it's moving towards the Huron River, in Arbor's sole remaining surface water supply. Right? This is not an uncommon problem. We're having this problem all over the world with polluting our groundwater and drawing more from the rivers than, they, than their actual flow rate. Uh, I've, sadly, I've taken these out, but there, I used to show pictures of the Colorado River, the Yangtze, the Nile, every, the Mekong, every great river in the world that you learned about in your history books. And I show these pictures of these people standing in gullies in the desert, and those are the deltas of these great rivers. We're actually drying up these rivers, pulling more water out then they deliver back out to the ocean during sometimes a year. We're literally draining the world's rivers for our water supply because we have this simplified system. This is what a fractal watershed looks like. This is what a centralized water system looks like. This is Grand Rapids, Michigan. This is Grand Rapids, Michigan on climate change. 
same water treatment plant that flooded in, uh, I think it was June or July of last year, uh, we had massive floods and people were kayaking in the streets and they were like, don't kayak in the streets. And they're like, oh, it's perfectly safe. I have a life jacket on. It's like, no, you're, you're kayaking in sewage. So raw sewage is flowing through the streets when the, when the streets flood. Ann Arbor uh, last year dumped 10,000 gallons of water, of, uh, of sewage, untreated sewage into the Huron River, again, our sole water supply, of raw sewage during that same flood event. Uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers gives our wastewater management a D. They give our drinking water a D. So in Brazil, they've come up with a really great solution to solve all of our water problems. Uh, they're uh, telling everybody that they need to uh, pee in the shower. Pee in the park! Get in the they're telling everybody, so they, look, look, monsters pee in the shower. Uh, old people pee in the shower. Uh, everybody. Michael Jordan pees in the shower. Monsters pee in the shower. Pop stars pee in the shower. Everybody pees in the, even Frankenstein pees in the shower. And if you two pee in the shower, if we all do this, we'd save a thousand liters of water every single year just by peeing in the shower. Look, even psycho killers do it and King Kong does it. Everybody's peeing in the shower, so you should pee in the shower too. But the problem is not whether or not we're peeing in the shower. The problem is that we're peeing in our drinking water. Right? This is the problem we need to solve. We have a very, very linear system. This is our house. Average American household uh, consumes about 300 gallons of water per day, uh, or 100 gallons per person per day. Our house, very low, 75 gallons per day. But this is how it works. We take the water from the treatment plant, we pipe it in, we get 75 gallons, we pee in it, we wash our clothes in it, we drink some of it, it all becomes toxic waste, goes into another pipe, one pipe, goes out to the sewage treatment plant. Some of that makes it back to the sewage treatment plant. It's very, very linear. The rain that falls on the, on the property doesn't stay on the property. All it gets runoff and goes into a nearby floodplain. After, it gets polluted by all of the rooftops and everything else. This was an analysis of a roof because we're going to be harvesting rainwater. So this was the roofing that we put on. Turns out, there were really high levels of lead in the water that we were testing off of the roof. They're like, what the hell? We know there's lead in there. Is really that much coming off? Turns out the Ecology Center of Ann Arbor did some tests, and they're now uh, beginning a study of roofing materials and how much is going into the environment because of the students' discovery on this. They had off-the-charts levels of lead, like way beyond what the EPA say should be in your drinking water. But even if you're not drinking the water from your roof, it's going into your gardens and everywhere else, and so there's a real question of how much. But the technology is here to do this, to get to net zero water, and the students at the University of Michigan are going to do this in our house. And they're gonna then they're going to find the appropriate scale to do this, because if a single house can do it that's old, we can do this all across communities, all across America, at a different scale, on a neighborhood scale. The centralized treatment plant works until it doesn't. We know we can do a single home to be net zero water, or a single building to be net zero water. Somewhere in between is going to be a really glorious solution. So I imagine a day when we're going to have these living spring houses all over uh, neighborhoods and cities, which will be little mini sewage treatment plants that are composting sewage waste, that use very, very little water, that are providing fresh water, filtering water, everything else that can be done just as safely as a centralized treatment plant can, but with much greater resiliency and at a much lower cost. So we really have to ask ourselves a question, what is the urgency? How quickly do we really need to be doing this? On Monday, I don't know if any of you caught this, I just learned about this yesterday. On Monday, a group of researchers down in uh, Antarctica discovered that the western shelf of Antarctica is melting at a rate that is way beyond anything and, is a, and could calve, right? The words they used in the study that they released after this discovery was that melt appears unstoppable. Sea level rise when this thing goes in this century will be 10 feet or more because of this one event. 10 feet or more. They're saying that it's unavoidable and that the collapse of this ice shelf is inevitable. It's going to happen. 400 parts per million in the atmosphere. That's where we are today. Last year was the first time we ever went over that number. Now, just as a reminder, 450 is the number to avoid all the most catastrophic consequences for humanity in the coming century. 
the PricewaterhouseCoopers did a little analysis for businesses to say, what should we be thinking about? How quickly do we need to get there? What do we do with business as usual? We have to reduce carbon emissions by 5.2% a year, every year through 2050. If we don't, that number goes up every single year. We don't meet that target. This was two years old. That number is bigger now. It's supposed to be getting down to zero, that we don't need to reduce it anymore because the total output into the atmosphere is near zero, what the scientists are telling us we need to do. So as business as usual, where we are today, if we, and it, in fairness, don't let this next slide scare you because it is not linear, but if it were, and if we were to continue exactly what we're doing right now, that's the parts per million by 2050. Okay, we can't go over 450. 1,200 is what PricewaterhouseCoopers is saying that we could go over, just doing simple math. So everybody knows a couple of years ago there was a um, typhoon that hit uh, the Philippines. And it was during the Doha Climate Conference. This was a speech given by the delegate from Doha, from uh, the Philippines, who incidentally a year later was at another climate conference. And during that climate conference, there was another typhoon that was worse than the one he's talking about here. An important backdrop for my delegation is the profound impacts of climate change that we are already confronting. And as we sit here every single hour, even as we vacillate and procrastinate here, we are suffering. Madam Chair, we have never had a typhoon like Bopa, which has wreaked havoc in a part of the country that has never seen a storm like this in half a century. Finally, Madam Chair, I'm making an urgent appeal, not as a negotiator, not as a leader of my delegation, but as a Filipino. I appeal to the whole world. I appeal to the leaders from all over the world to open our eyes to the stark reality that we face. I appeal to ministers. The outcome of our work is not about what our political masters want. It is about what is demanded of us by seven billion people. I appeal to all. Please, no more delays, no more excuses. Please, let Doha be remembered as the place where we found the political will to turn things around. I don't think there's been a time where I've ever heard that, where I didn't get tears in my eyes, and then I showed this picture of my daughter. This is my daughter, Jane. In the year 2050, she's going to be 42 years old. 42 years old. She's now five years old. <laughs> she has a little sister, Dahlia. Dahlia will be 37 in the year 2050. So the work that we're doing is so incredibly urgent, and these goals are incredibly ambitious, but everything that we do in the USGBC, at Anderson Windows, every work that we, piece of work that we do has to have this sense of urgency to it. And when we understand the why we have to do this stuff, that net zero energy is mandatory and net zero water is mandatory, then the how is gonna flow very, very easily. And we can get to zero output by the year 2030. And if there's any question of, can we really make this happen this quickly, let's just take a quick history lesson of just the city of Detroit, of how rapidly things can transform. This is Woodward Avenue, the main corridor that goes through the center of Detroit. Woodward Avenue has the distinction of being the first asphalt paved road in the world. This was 1908. There were no paved roads. It was also the year that Henry Ford started manufacturing his automobile. And who would have imagined that by 1920, this would be Woodward Avenue? I assume they picked the dead horse up off the road there. This is the city of Detroit. It took 200 years for it to become one of the largest, one of the most prosperous cities on the planet, fourth largest city in America. It's gonna take only a few years to take some of the 70 to 80,000 abandoned homes, homes, and put them into landfill. This is the proposal now. They're taking all of these buildings and putting them into landfills, as one writer put it, going from a house to trash in the time that it takes to do a load of laundry. What if we really 
rethought what we're doing with these buildings and seeing how quickly things can go bad or go forward. This was just released this week from Google Maps. You can now go to a Google Map and see a same spot and how it changes over time. This was 2009. This was 2011 in Detroit. This is 2009, and if you look at this photograph, you can see all of the trash cans all out there. People were living in these homes. That's 2011. Here's people sitting in 2009 on their front porch. This is 2011. This is today. I know you're all looking at these pictures and thinking how sad it is, but I am, I, I am not just saying this. I've never even been to a Chamber of Commerce meeting, but I have more hope for the city of Detroit than any city in the world. If I could pick one place to really transform and do the work that we want to do and create the model for a living city, created of living component parts, it is Detroit. This is the Kendrick building several years ago, Kendrick Manufacturing. This is the Kendrick building now. This is the book Cadillac Hotel. Now imagine being the woman in the fur coat having dinner with her husband and having cocktails and coming back to this building. This is the book Cadillac Hotel now. This is Orchestra Hall. Probably the same woman with the same fur coat. Listen to a concert there. This is Orchestra Hall now. These are streets now in Detroit. What if we were to take some of those materials that are being pushed into landfills? I estimate there were well over, very conservatively, over a half billion dollars worth of amazing materials in these buildings that can be harvested to build net zero energy and net zero water buildings and create these living communities. And this is what people are working on now in Detroit. So Richard Alley, he's a climate scientist at Penn, after this report came out on Monday about what's happening in Antarctica, said, if we have indeed lit the fuse on West Antarctica, it's hard to imagine putting out the fuse. But, he added, there's a bunch more fuses. There's a bunch more matches. And we have a decision now of do we light those? So every time we take an old home and rehab it, be 100% electricity, no combustion in the house, no gas, harvested all of its energy from the sun to be net zero energy, we choose not to light the next fuse. Every time a school, this is the Berkshire School in Seattle, decides to be net zero water and actually restore the ecological water flow while still getting the benefit of that natural rainfall on the site, they choose to not light the next fuse. Every time we create a building like the Bullet Center in Seattle, a multi-story office building that's life enhancing, that harvests its own energy, harvests its own water, we choose not to light the next fuse. And every time we create living buildings that are the least risk buildings we could possibly build, if the new Ford plant over here, if we create a place there there, actually, people have said this when they talked about, oh, oh, no, no, that's too risky to build like that. Risk? You want risk. Risk is doing things the way we've always done them. And I was astonished to learn that they actually tore down the entire factory, including the Albert Kahn section of that, and now it's just a big paved, empty lot. So we're doing the same thing, shipping all those materials to landfills. So every time we build a living building, and if we choose to do this on the Ford property, we're choosing to be part of a transformation to communities that are socially just, that are culturally rich, and are ecologically restorative, and we choose not to light the next fuse and create a really, really beautiful, beautiful place and comfort where we can experience love and happiness and joy. So I can't even begin to tell you how vital the work that you're doing in this room is. I mean, vital. And the choices you make to moving us to happiness, whatever the weather. Those choices, the Chinese say the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, the second best time is now. So let's start now. And I'll finish with just this, and then I'll stay as long as you guys want to ask questions, because we should really have a great dialogue after this. 
Benoit Mandelbrot, again, the father of fractal geometry, said that bottomless wonders spring from simple rules which are repeated without end. So now let's get to work. Thank <laughs> you.